Welcome to the Research Reimagine podcast, brought to you by Nottingham Trent University. I'm your host, Helen Darby Dowman, and I'll be inviting some of NTU's brightest minds to explore how their research is helping us to deepen our understanding of the world. From online addictions to transgender rights and sleep disorders, listen as we discuss some of society's most pressing challenges and uncover some of the ways our research is making a difference. Barbie isn't just a doll, she's a cultural phenomenon. In this special episode of the Research Reimagine podcast, we explore Barbie's influence on feminism and fashion over the years and explore how this iconic brand has helped to shape society and popular culture for three generations. In light of Barbie's 65th anniversary this year, we're taking a deep dive into Barbie's past, present and future and explore whether Barbie has successfully transformed into a symbol of empowerment or if the brand is still shackled with outdated stereotypes. Today I'm joined by Hoi Ying Kerr, a senior lecturer in the Nottingham School of Art and Design, who is going to be sharing her knowledge on the topic. Ying, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Ying, can you just start by telling us a bit about the evolution of Barbie as a brand? Like, where did she come from? And how has that image changed over the last 65 years? Well, Barbie was created, her birthday, March 9th, 1959. Um, But actually, she started a little bit before that. She was inspired by her creator, Ruth Handler, on her 1956 trip to Europe, who came across a German doll, the Bild Lily. Uh, This was in the post-war period as well, if you remember. And her husband, conveniently enough, was a co-founder of Mattel. uh, And so she had an easy route into the toy industry, although um, he wasn't actually very much of a fan of Barbie initially. I mean, if you think about a manufacturer of toys for children and suddenly um, we get a a doll that was based on a rather sexy German in the post-war period doll, uh, you can see why he might have had reservations. However, in the first year of her creation and distribution, she was such an overnight success that they had to continue and thus Barbie was born. Uh, Barbie was named after Ruth's daughter, Barbara, and of course later on Ken, was named after her son. Um, And if you think about it, she was also a beneficiary of the post-war development of new materials. So especially the commercial expansion of vinyl, plastics, as well as the new industrial techniques and manufacturing that followed the Second World War. So in a sense, we also see Barbie as a product of the technical advances of the Second World War, as well as being the development of a toy and play that is framed against the Cold War during the second half of the 20th century. Uh, In terms of Barbie's representation, uh, the intention of Handler was to create a doll that replicated adult women rather than the child baby dolls that were the norm at the time. So in this was a desire to give girls the opportunity to role play different options as adult women. Notably, the head was designed to come off so that multiple outfits could be swapped and changed over. So there's a lot of role play intentionally with this doll, but where the child was intending to transplant their self into the doll rather than being a sort of mother to a baby doll child. Um, And in this, we really have to think about the context of toys, actually, uh, and the history of toys, because it's really important to remember that toys are not benign. They've always actually been used to train and shape children for their jobs in the future. Uh, Ancient games, for example, include things like hide-and-seek, which would train children in hunter-gatherer techniques. There's war games as well, so cowboys and Indians, for example, as well as What's the Time, Mr. Wolf, another example of hunter-gatherer, but where perhaps there's more predatory prey rather than gatherer. Uh, girls games, notably, often included those including uh, that involved housework, cooking and child-rearing, so we were really training up little girls up to this point to become uh, carers for people as they grew up that socialised them. So Barbie was originally a play that was designed to train and develop little girls. It's not just women, but modern women with boyfriends, jobs, careers, and so on. However, um, it's also specifically an American version of femininity. So framed against the Cold War, as we remember this point in time, um, and in which her cultural popularity uh, coincides with, Barbie was actually, if you think about it, a poster girl for the American dream, really important in the propaganda war against the sort of communists at the time. And in so doing so, she was teaching little girls not only about romance and about being a modern woman, but also how to be a good American consumer citizen. So this includes having the houses, the clothes, the jobs, the cars, the holidays, the boyfriends. And wrapped, wrapped up in this is the dream of not only becoming and having everything you could ever want to be, you know, in your very own dream house, 
but reinvention also being the key, but also of being an individual. So if you look at Barbie, she's not only just, uh, she's not actually part of a collective, but she's actually an individual who shines on her own. And there are multiple versions of the same persons, but importantly, they don't really identify as one group, but are individuals. And this is really important to think about in the sort of uh, politics at the time and sort of the American kind of ethos at the time and the American dream of being an individual and having the freedom to express oneself. Um, and so while there are many different versions of Barbie and Ken, tellingly, uh, uh, and, in, you know, there are some that are taboo. I think there's even a magic ear in Ken that, um, you know, actually was even shown in the Greta Gerwig film, uh, you know, that came out recently towards the end. So if you look, watch the film closely towards the end, you'll see magic ear in Ken. And he's known as the unofficial, you know, gay Ken. Um, but tellingly, there are no communist or socialist uh, Barbie or Ken. So there are none that I could find anyway. So they do reflect the sort of um, politics of the time. So it sounds like there's a complex relationship between Barbie and feminism. Is that fair? Um, I mean, yes, you could. The short answer would probably be yes, <laughs> but also uh, understandably so. So... Um, through the, through the late 20th century, of course, uh, feminists did look at Barbie as well and heavily critiqued her. Um, and I think this all culminated, especially in sort of the early 2000s into the 2010s, where she did suffer a bit of a backlash as mothers looked to gender neutralize their girls' toys. Um, and this was also part of the backlash against the post-feminism of the 1990s and 2000s. So if we recall Sex and the City and all, and WAGs and all this kind of um, regressive look at femininity as a, as a way of coming to terms with the demands on women to be everything, to look good and to hold careers down. And as women became disillusioned with the feminist uh, project, they started becoming post-feminist. And so by the 2010s, women were then backlashing against uh, women regressing in the sense of the femininity of, of wanting to be um, you know, kept housewives, for example. So we, had, we saw in the 2010s women looking to reclaim their bodies and fashions, for example, away from restrictive stereotypes through things such as the body positivity movement, which, uh, if you think about it, when applied to Barbie, would see a, a huge issue. And so she came under critique for her unrealistic proportions, her unabashed hyper-femininity, and interpretations of her ethos as being a symbol of restrictive patriarchy-aligned femininity. Um, but recently, we've seen an upsurge in interest in Barbie, started by the Greta Gerwig movie. Uh, and this can be seen as part of the wider retro nostalgia for the 1990s and the early, early millennial style. Uh, and it's been most visible in fashion. Uh, this nostalgia can be seen as not only part of the fashion cycle, but also a more fundamental yearning for a time of perceived economic stability and prosperity. And in included in this is an embrace of the 90s and 2000s post-feminism that we just spoke about, as well as a feeling of social cohesion where class and gender barriers were felt to have been dismantled by the efforts of the previous decades. Uh, so contrast that with the current ongoing stagnation and austerity, climate crisis and crisis in gender relations. And there's no wonder, actually, that now there's a yearning for a time that in recent living memory seems so carefree, free of war certain, and felt more certain, as well as liberated from worry. So as class and geopolitical barriers seem to have widened for us, we've not only become We've uh, more fragmented a society. Uh, we've also been divided into haves and have-nots. So Barbie brings us back to a time of late 20th century and early 21st century optimism. And I don't think it's just about gender. I think it's actually a more historical feeling that we have about our current time that we're reflecting now in our attitudes towards Barbie again. So does Barbie conform to the, the traditional beauty standards? You know, like obviously she's blonde and the pink and her unrealistic proportions perhaps. Um, is that the focus of her beauty and appearance? Um, so, I mean, appearance is, is very much part of it. You know, she's sort of giving the little girls these dreams of dressing up, I suppose. And, um, you know, these uh, dreams of... of um, uh, and, and play in, in dressing up, and she's training girls, I suppose, in, in these practices of, of appearance and the importance of appearance, of course, and this might reflect a lot about sort of consumerist life as well, and uh, in a way urban life too, where people don't know you, so what you wear really counts to expressing who you are. Um, but actually, um, if you look at 
Barbie, uh, historically, she's actually an indicator of what society is like at the time. So she's a historical figure and a weather, weather vane for changing values. So she does reflect what's going on at the time as well, which makes her really, really interesting. Um, so if you look back historically at the Barbie outfits, you've got 70s Malibu uh, Barbie and Superstar Barbie, which reflects sort of the glam phase, and, but also um, things like the sort of beachy kind of scene of the 70s uh, and the Californian dream. Um, you've got 80s Barbies who feature lots of conservative themed styles and that actually, so things like high school prom and sweetheart kind of dresses and these actually relate to the Republican conservative values of 80s America. Um, 90s retro Barbie, which is, uh, and a lot of TV themed Barbie, so there's Baywatch for example and there's uh, retro sort of nostalgic styles. It reflects the 90s nostalgia that you get in the, in the period just before the millennium, before the turn of the 20th to, to, to the 21st century. Um, and then, of course, in the early 2000s, you've got things like, in 2004, Barbie and Ken famously broke up on Valentine's Day. Uh, and then they embarked on life as singles out in the world before coming back together in 2011. Again, on Valentine's Day, they had their reunion as a couple. So this is actually partly an acknowledgement of the realities of modern life, especially dating life. We see it coincides with things like Sex in the City and other kinds of uh, exploratory um, uh, media about romance, you know, friends, things like that. But it's also uh, about, it also uses these marketing, new marketing tech strategies and techniques that also were developing at the end of the 20th century, early 21st century. Um, so you know, uh, Barbie's actually really useful as an as looking at periods of time, actually as an expression of what's going on, rather than just about reinforcing stereotypes. Um, and then currently, I would say that she's undergoing another refresh, actually. Barbie's for some time now. She's been trying to update herself. So it's not just through modeling Barbie having access to different kinds of careers and activities, but notably, notably through addressing issues of diversity through incorporating Barbies of different races and abilities. Um, and she's also not been immune to the influence of celebrity culture. So featuring over the years, numerous singers, actors, sports people, thinkers. She's even had the royal family, you know, reimagined as Barbie dolls. Um, an example is maybe um, Wills and Kate, you know, when they got married, they got reimagined as Barbie dolls. Um, and of course, you know, the recent Greta Gerwig film in 2023, which has been coasting on this wave of interest in hyperfemininity. We've got lots of things like cottagecore and, you know, bow culture, I think, and all sorts of things. And of course, barbiecore and things like that. So as well as we've got the success of the Marvel film franchise. So we're using these interesting new marketing techniques to do with cross-media channels and film and product. And actually, that's now being taken on board by the Mattel universe, I guess you could say. So this has been giving Barbie a new, more ironic lease of life, breathing in a more cynical and grown-up form of Barbie as tongue-in-cheek entertainment and commercial nostalgia. So in this way, Barbie is actually developing into a dual-function toy, one that's still marketed at little girls, but that's also aimed at, at uh, grown-ups as a cultural toy uh, for a role for playing nostalgia and ethical dilemmas in the world. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about Barbie, obviously, and, and you reference the, the movie, it's so focused around fashion as well, isn't it? Yeah. And the different parts of fashion, and through the many years of Barbie, yeah. we've seen her be everything in and anything almost. So in terms of the fashion side of it, does, has she had an influence on fashion? Uh, yes, absolutely. So you get these um, brand collaborations between sorry, famous fashion designers as well as brands. Um, and I'm not sure if you know this, but Barbie core was the summer trend of 2022 <laughs> in anticipation of the Barbie movie. And you may have noticed it or it may have passed you by. That's absolutely fine. Um, but Barbie's influence on fashion has actually been around a lot longer than that. So her long-standing fashion designer is Carol Spencer, who has been coming up with the trends for Barbie and, you know, identifying the trends and making fashion a pillar of her iconic status. But she's also had lots and lots of new, uh, you know, designer collaborations. So um, Giorgio Armani, Christian Dior, Bill Blass, Oscar, Oscar de la Renta. She's had wedding dresses designed by Vera Wang and Carolina Herrera. Christian Louboutin has, of course, designed pink shoes for her. Of course, what else? 
Um, she's also inspired fashion in the real world. So some people have traced Barbie core to the early 2000s female celebrities. So we've got Paris Hilton, if you remember her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Nicole Richie, her best friend, until they broke up, you know, whoever. Well, I'm not sure what's happening with their friendship anymore. And um, Britney Spears as, as well, who was known for her little girl sort of style before becoming more risque. And, and we've been following her life as, as, you know, through the decades, haven't we? Uh, as well as films as Clueless, uh, Legally Blonde, Ronnie and Michelle's High School Reunion, and of course Mean Girls. So we've got a lot of um, using and riffing of Barbie's aesthetic as hyperfeminine and tongue-in-cheek kitsch. And so have these partnerships reinforced Barbie's legacy, do you think, or influenced the stereotypes at all? Barbie has been both a stereotype but actually, I would actually also identify her as a cultural asset because she is iconic. Um, so from initially mimicking adult women and fashions or the mid-century for girls to role play and after decades of play, uh, Barbie's widespread popularity uh, and commercial success has meant that for many grown women who've actually grown up with her, Barbie's influence is pervasive and deep-rooted. Anything rooted in childhood is going to be deep-rooted. So she's actually gone from reflecting what's going on to the world to becoming the inspiration itself. And that's why she is so both effective as a cultural icon, but affective. Well, we mean she inspires the emotions in people, affective with an A. And it's, she becomes the starting point for more discussions on femininity. And just to go back to that point that you asked about um, stereotyping, um, I would say that, and traditional standards of beauty, I would say that she both reflects this uh, standards of beauty, but she's a, dom she's a barometer for dominant standards of beauty as well. Um, and so originating from a Western culture of historic idealizing of small waists, which have got its history in corsetry, um, it's unsurprising that Barbie started with unrealistic proportions. And we have to remember um, having, for example, a larger sort of bust line also emphasizes the small waist, which might have its uh, sort of historic roots in things like fertility and youth and so on, with, with it emphasizing the larger hips, actually. That's what small waists do. So um, it's unsurprising that Barbie sort of reflects these sort of turn of events. Um, and added to the fact that she's a design doll, so she also portrays the interests of the people in control. So how she changes, therefore, indicates the shifts in cultural standards, as well as the power balance of those dominant narratives and who gets to tell them. So, uh, you know, it's unsurprising that she also reflects a dominant Western narrative around beauty, because these are the people who are designing her and their sort of agendas behind it, uh, even if they are unconscious agendas. So the recent Barbie movie has sparked conversations about challenging the stereotypes that you, we've just talked about. Do you think Barbie has succeeded in redefining herself as a symbol of empowerment, or are there still elements of the brand that are trapped in the past? Um, I think it's a little bit complicated, actually, to explain that, um, because she's, she, I don't think she's a simple post-feminist, if we can say that, plaything and just a retro nostalgia for 90s girlhood. So it's not an, a binary either or, but it might even be both. So, and it's not that um, uh, she's trapped, but she's maybe using some of these things. So, and it's not that, um, it, it's not that we're seeing her as this um, very simple binary figure that is either or. She's neither oppressing us and nor is she sort of striving forward to the future. Um, it's more that our, awareness of our times are more complex um, and that in a way our attitude to our times is really more serious than the 1990s or 2000s for example um, and our awareness of it is more acute so where before for example in the early 21st century and even before then we could brush inequalities off such as everyday sexism and racism um, now we're facing up to the consequence of what that entails um, and we are starting to reassess it. So when we look back to the 90s or the 2000s, we suddenly realise, uh, and we see actresses, for example, suddenly coming out. Monica Lewinsky, for example, is one of them who've, who's come out more recently to say, hang on a minute, how I was treated wasn't right. It wasn't cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you suddenly go, hang on. Why was it okay for men to just grope you in a club and that was you brushed it off and thought it was fine or for them to wolf whistle at you in the 90s or 2000s and you brushed it off or laughed it off? So now we're suddenly realising actually 
that the everyday sexism, the everyday racism um, actually weren't okay and we have to take them more seriously. And we're facing up to those consequences. Uh, for example, there's historic abuses that have happened from the wine scene abuse of power, uh, even down to the current crisis of pornographization of society that's happened from all of those decades of Nuts and Zoo magazines and other kinds of explicit magazines that were out at the time. So we've realized that ignoring it allows it to happen. And while this has, in a way, you could say, triggered a crisis in masculinity uh, that has come out and that's been performed by Ben, uh, sorry, pardon me, Ken, <laughs> in the Barbie movie, in the latest Barbie movie. Um, Greta Gerwig explores this call to action in the literal collectivizing of Barbies as part of the self-actualizing process. And that's quite funny, because I did talk about how there's never been really a socialist communist Barbie, and yet in the latest movie, we're seeing a collectivization of the individual Barbies to come together to have a call for action, uh, not in, for, in terms of socialism or communism, but actually for feminism, which yeah. is quite interesting. And, it, and it's being done to resist the infiltration of toxic masculinity into the girl universe and neutralize it not through oppression, repression or oppression, but listening and with dialogue. So Barbie, of course, isn't without its issues or her issues. Poor old Barbie. Notably, <laughs> <laughs> notably in her journey to self-actualization, the characters in the movie, they never manage to free themselves of capitalism and consumption. And the tacit tongue-in-cheek acknowledgement of this makes it worse in the cynical compliance with the system. Uh, because they're, say, they're knowingly saying, oh, we know it and we still comply with it. And this actually echoes our own complicity and role in toxic consumerism, as well as the thing that wasn't ever mentioned in the movie, which is climate change. So the effects of all those accessories, the plastic, the vinyl, the, you know, all of that, and the transportation of all these goods, etc., and the hosting of things. And you think, ah, no one mentioned climate change, you know. So that's, that's one of the sort of, I would say, critiques of the movie. So looking ahead, what do you think is next for Barbie? And uh, like, how can she continue to stay relevant and influential in the years to come? Goodness, that is a big question. I mean, <laughs> it is a big question. Poor old Barbie again. That's my, that's my refrain. A she's having, of, she, sorry, a lot of weight on her shoulders. Isn't she's there? having to carry so yeah. much, along with her out oversized proportions <laughs> <laughs> on those tiny, tiny feet. Yes, uh, absolutely. Constantly on point. Uh, I, in some ways, she also uh, mirrors the superwoman that we've had to become. That post-feminism has identified the woman who has it all, who is an astronaut, who is a scientist, who looks fabulous, has pointy feet in heels all the time and uh, has dazzlingly white teeth and it remains slim I mean you know the poor thing must be exhausted <laughs> <laughs> I would think so <laughs> so considering what we've just spoken about um, there are only so many things that she can do uh, and yet, surprisingly, she's very multifunctional. So she, in her role, uh, she's a toy, plaything, and a model for girlhood. And within that, we can see Barbie's real function in society. Because um, toys are not just playthings in which society trains up their children, although they are partly that. They're also, uh, it, the relationship goes both ways. They're also tools of agency in their playmates. As communicative tools for expression, they are also aids for development, operating as transitional objects in which we move from state to state, from childhood to adulthood. So we see the little girls playing with the dolls and they, they become the doll, they, they role play things and practice things. That's what play is also for, but back again. And so we return to childhood when we ex access these dolls and that's what adults do when they go back and look at things like Barbie, they, they transition back into childhood. Um, and they can also be used to communicate our desires through wish fulfillment, such as becoming the first woman astronaut or to have an idealized romantic partner who is perfect. Um, they can help, therefore, to soothe and solve the pressures of approaching adulthood and solve problems through simulating role play or just providing comfort. So in this way, toys and other emblems of childhood are important for our development at all ages. And I'd say that part Barbie, rather than being a toy of nostalgia, is operating as that transitional object for society, allowing us to look back and reassess, to model versions of ourselves onto her before we make that leap into a more realized, liberated, but socially conscious womanhood. So in terms of what is Barbie today and what can she be, I would really hope that she can start to portray the complexities and the conflicting desires and realities of women and girls today. But also it's that transitional object. Barbie can comfort us, she can soothe us, and as we look back, enable us to learn more about ourselves, what we want, what we don't want, and to springboard into the women we know that we can become. 
Ying, thank you so much. It's been really interesting to hear about Barbie's journey over the last 65 years and also what she represents to all of us, you know, whether it's our own childhoods or we're now living through our own children and children to come. So thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, fantastic. I had a great time. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. If you'd like to find out more about Ying's research, please have a look at the episode description. You've been listening to the Research Reimagine podcast by Nottingham Trent University. For all of the latest news from the research community at NTU, follow us on Twitter at NTU underscore research or sign up to our research newsletter by visiting ntu.ac.uk forward slash research. Thanks for listening.